let's shake off the holiday funk and get our chops back in shape, and you finally get the chance to hold me accountable. Metal Base Monday. So to start off this week, uh, I'd like to get some input from you. I've got a real curiosity thing going and some debates going with a couple other people. If you could design your own base, or you could get another base to have some features you want that you think are important to a lot of people, not just yourself, what would they be? I know all of us, you know, kind of want to nitpick our bases and we want some option that we only find useful or something like that. But what things do you think are missing on a bass that you would love to see in an instrument and you hear as a common complaint or you think is something that's just missing that a lot of people are searching for? I'd be really interested to hear it. So hit me down in the comments and uh, let's have a chat about it. And so you getting to hold me accountable while I hold you accountable. What did I mean by that on the intro? Well, uh, as you saw on last episode, and of course you watched the last episode, when I talked about the idea of death ground and forcing yourself to have accountability to progress further and motivate yourself, I realize I talk a lot on the show about uh, practice techniques, uh, motivating yourself, getting strict regimens down, and really pushing past your own personal barriers and exceeding your own expectations, and that that's what it really takes. I do very much have a put up or shut up kind of attitude when it comes to live playing or your band being able to pull off its songs live, all that. I'm a big believer in don't talk, show. And I think my opinions on the show and my ideas about practice and what I relate to you guys kind of says that. So with last week's commentary, where I mentioned a lot about, you know, filming yourself or putting yourself out in public on a regular basis after announcing your goals so that you have to achieve them or embarrass yourself. And my patrons know that I've put up a thing called the 30 day challenge where I talk about how to motivate yourself through 30 days and achieve a goal and how to really hone in on your weak spots and how to absolutely meet a goal you probably didn't think you could within a 130 day period. One of the common pieces of feedback I've gotten is that they don't find a way to get consistent accountability. Like they may put up videos for their friends or things like that, but their friends just either don't pay attention or they're not feeling like they get the pressure or feedback that helps them keep propelling. So in my honoring my own put up or shut up, I'm gonna do it for you. So in the coming year after the holiday uh, in January, I'm going to run a program where you can sign up and I'm gonna hold you accountable every single day. No joke. What will happen is if you sign up, you sign up with a single goal that you want to be able to master within 30 days. Every single day you will report to me and I'm gonna analyze your playing. I'm gonna look for your weak spots, give you advice on how to hone and correct your ideas and how to make your practice more effective. Every single day, you're gonna to have to report into me. You gotta have it done or I will be the guy who goes, hey, where's that video? Or, hey, how come you didn't progress from yesterday? I can tell you didn't do your work. Every day, I'm with you for 30 days. So not only will you get the chance to level up and have me guide you through it and encourage you and do all that kind of stuff, but you're going to be able to hold me accountable because I talk a good game and I put out that, you know, diligent hard work gets it done every time and that the more you learn that you can accomplish the things you want with good methodology and that encouragement uh, just has incredible rewards for yourself, not just in your playing, but in your self-esteem and things like that, you can hold me accountable. At the end of that 30 days, my method better have worked for you. My encouragement and my showing you how to guide yourself through better have leveled you up in what you thought was possible for yourself. So you're going to get to pass a little judgment on me at the end and say, did all the stuff and all the methodologies he talked about really pay off? I'm willing to put it on the table. I'm willing to stand behind it. Are you willing to stand behind potentially 
leveling up in a way you may not have thought possible. If you're interested in signing up for the program, uh, I'm going to start checking over the month of December what kind of interest there is, how many potential people. Uh, of course, there's going to be a discount for the program for my patrons, and they'll be first in line. But if you're interested, email me at rodney at rodneymcgee.com and just put in the subject line so I can put you into a folder for people interested in doing reach out and kind of updating you with how it's going to go. Put 30-day regimen. I really hope that uh, a good chunk of you will sign up for it because, again, I've been getting great feedback on the advice I've given, but, again, a lot of people say that they just don't have that initial start or they can't get that lift off. So I feel like if I'm the one preaching it, I'm the one that's going to have to walk the walk with you. And it'd be great to see that many people that have become friends with or just even casual acquaintances through the channel here see them level up and the stuff that I start introducing with the new series and stuff get even more impact because you'll be at a higher level to take advantage of it. So I hope to see you on that one. And if nothing else, you get the point finger at the end of the month at me. And again, my patrons, thank you so much. As always, it's greatly appreciated. And like I said, uh, you'll get priority depending on the capacity I feel I can take I can take on for the month. And there'll be a discount on the program for you. Thank you as always, and check your channel. Uh, there's going to be that new video going up, as promised, about the start of the Ultimate Recording and Songwriting series. It's going to be probably the most important talk I've ever given, and it's going to determine so much about how much you actually get out of anything you ever do. Starting a band, progressing in a music career, even just practicing or taking it on as a hobby. There's a step that so many people ignore, and it determines success or failure every time. We're going to talk about what that is in the new video, so I'll see you on that one. So another question I get asked a lot is, after breaks in playing or when you've just had things that have kind of cut back on your basic functional skills and things, how do you get up and running, and what practice routines and exercises do I do? to kind of jump back into shape and get my hands functioning again. Definitely need it after uh, this Thanksgiving. Oof. <laughs> Try moving to a new house, holidays, guests, re-outfitting things. It's been nuts, so I'm definitely doing this routine again. And again, if you've looked back on the series, I'm a big fan of doing what I call dark matter practice, where you try and fit multiple things into one set of practice ideas so when you sit down, you know that the things you're going to do are going to cover a lot inside of a short period of time. So I'm going to get my visualizations back down, my right hand, my left hand, multiple techniques all into a couple of basic principles so that I'm not spending hours trying to accomplish them one at a time. So here's a couple of things I do and see if these help you out. One of the most simple and fundamental is getting my right hand and left hand in sync with each other. And people don't realize how crucial this is. Having this hand move fast and this hand move fast are great. They have to be in sync with each other. This is why some people just sound like sloppy garbage, and some people you can hear the notes clearly executed one at a time. It's because one hand starts playing faster than the other. It's like they just go for it, and they don't sync them up. The other reason I use this is because I play with three fingers, my tendency, at least for me physically, is these two fingers generally are the ones who slow down first. These keep a little bit of speed, these get slow faster. So as soon as I start to feel that, I'll isolate those two and just play with them and do a number of exercises to kind of bring them back up to speed. If you don't play with three fingers, then just use your two and do the same exercise. And what I do is pretty simple. It's I'll start down at this end of the neck, and like I said, for me, I'm going to do these two rear fingers to get them back up to speed, and I'm just going to go with my first finger and then my third finger. So you kind of want to think of it as a one finger per fret, four fret area. So one, two, three, four. You just lay your hand down. And then I'll go one, three, two, four. One, three, two, four. 
just across the neck, and then I'm going to do that in the backward order, going two, four, one, three, two, four, one, three. And then I'm going to move that up a half step at a time. If you haven't played in a little bit, you're definitely going to get a little crampy. Your muscles are going to wake up a little bit. This one really helps me out a lot. And what I find this helps me out and when I need it the most is uh, I've been playing actually a lot of guitar lately. So reorienting myself from a 25-5 neck to a 35 neck, it you know, it just it feels a little different and the spread's a little wider. So getting my hand used to really kind of get that stretch being natural and comfortable. That really helps out. And it's also kind of a way of getting my hand locked into a position again where I have that touch sensitivity of knowing where all my notes are underneath one hand position. So, you know, if I need to hit a six, a five, a four, I know where everything is, and I kind of get that sense memory back down again. This one really helps, that one. Now, another one I'll do is, after I've done that kind of a reasonable distance up and down the neck, is I'll go one, two, three, four, then my first finger on the next string, and then back down. What I'm trying to get, now that I've gotten all my separations down, I want to get my rolling and sequentials back in order. So I'll go. So it goes one, two, three, four, up to my first finger on the next string, then back down. Then I go one, two, three, or four again, and then one, two, three, four on the next string. So it looks like this. Again, that one's got a short rollo, you know, just one up there uh, going from one string to the next, but it's mostly getting my fingers in that habit of getting my roll down. And what you want to concentrate on is keeping your fingers close to the board. And when after you fret these notes, you don't want your hand doing this. Keep your fingers down, almost like they're posting the next note, the next note. Almost imagine that you can't fret that note without fretting this one. You want to keep it locked down. See how little my hand's moving? So that one helps me out a lot. And then I come to the third part, which is the final combination. And this one also does a number of things to really kind of help me get back to shred shape, as it were. Uh, what this one accomplishes is string skipping, which is difficult for both hands, fingerboard visualization, which is harder to do. A lot of people learn their scales and they can only think about them if they're playing them one string at a time. It's hard for them to visualize it accurately if they're kind of, you know, having to jump in between. They can only see it as one complete block. The other is People have a problem jumping strings with this. So I'm going to bring back in my third finger because that's how I would string skip. And what I'll do is take, say, my minor scale, and that's going to go like this. Okay, so I'm going three, five, six, three, five, six. Then on the next three strings, three, five, seven. Okay, so with these three fingers all rolling and kind of keeping my rotation accurate, I'm going to go three, five, six on the B string, then three, five, seven, skipping a string because my scale is. So I'm going to go 
See that? Then the same pattern on the E string. So I'm skipping a string each time, then moving forward. All together it would go. That's going to get all this together. And it's going to get a lot of rocking back and forth, having to move between the two strings. That one really, by the time I get that one up to speed, forward and backward, when I know I'm at about 180 BPM, my chops are pretty much back in shape. I can, you know. Going backwards, you want to descend, not go up. By the time you can keep all those clean, making sure you get that uh, center string you're not playing muted well, I usually kind of lightly touch with this finger as I'm barring across. As you go across these, when you can play those accurately and easily, I, I don't see much that you're really not going to be able to come to grips with. So you've got alternating one hand and moving across, sequential, then you've got string skipping, you've got getting your fingerboard visualizations and being able to see long jumps, you've got working on your weak fingers, and you've got working on three fingers. So that's pretty much the regimen I do, and I'll just do it for a while, uh, probably like a half hour. I'll go through each of these, and then I'll go on to new techniques that I want to learn or things like that, or if I'm rehearsing some songs, I'll work on them. Over the course of about a week, I'll be back into, you know, top shape if I'm diligent on it and just kept it up. So consistency matters. Do it every day. Don't do two hours one day and nothing for three days. Every single day, even if it's a half hour, that's going to get you in your wheelhouse and back into shape. And man, all that turkey gravy is like sludge in the blood. We need this one. So... Try this routine out and let me know if that works out for you. And I'd be interested to hear, do you have anything that just seems to kickstart your hands that's reliable for you where you're able to go, man, I got to get back up to fighting weight here. What do you do that kind of kickstarts that for you? Or do you have a specific problem that doesn't seem to go away and you can't get caught up with? Let's talk about it down in the comments. I'll see you there. I'm going to close up this week. Uh, I've wound up in a couple discussions arguing a certain point and it's come up in different ways it seems to come up a lot and i think it really comes down to a subject of defeatism and it really gets on my nerves honestly at a certain point because i feel like people generally are always looking for what an excuse as to why someone they admire or especially someone giving them advice is so much more capable of doing something than they are. Like the one I've been having a lot recently is the argument in between talent versus work. And I'm a big proponent that talent is almost a hindrance. And I know a lot of people go, what the hell are you talking about? Who wouldn't want to be talented? So many people I know that are talented just don't go anywhere with it. It's because Everybody tells them, oh, you're so talented, or they see that initial thing that they can do something a little better, so then they don't work. They get lazy about it and think, oh, well, I'm talented, so I don't have to do this. I know an incredible amount of talented failures. Work gets it done every time. I know this is the oldest thing in the book, the tortoise and the hare lecture. I don't know how many thousands of years of human history we have to hear this from, but there is no excuse for it. And working diligently at something is always going to pay off no matter what, period. Hard work trumps talent every time. So you just have to decide, do you want it or not? And like I said, I hear this come up in conversations all the time about, and it's always kind of a slightly different angle, but it comes down to the same thing of, well, I, didn't, I don't have as much time to practice as this person does. Or, well, that person had this special ability, or not everybody's a genius innovator. Or that No, you may not be, you know, the greatest that ever lived, but I'm never going to be Leonardo da Vinci. Does that mean I should, you know, never draw anything? To, it, it's just kind of a, a bad argument. It's saying unless you can become the greatest there, that there has ever been on something, 
or to this almost supernatural level of ability, then anything below it isn't worth trying at. And I would say the overwhelming majority of the bands in the world having really good careers right now stand in defiance of that because a lot of them, let's face it, these guys work hard, but there's not a lot of talent there. It really is one of those things where it is a truism. Don't ever doubt it. If you are, you know, blaming it on your age or the amount of time you have or anything else, it's amazing how, think about the amount of things in your life that you were determined to get done and you found a way. If you wanted something really bad and people told you you couldn't have it or whether it was sneaking a piece of cake or going to see a girl when you were underage or going to see a guy when you were underage or whatever it was, you always figured it out somehow. So if you really want to, you're going to be able to do something and at a great level. Hard work pays off and it pays dividends. Talent is actually inert. It doesn't do anything unless you put something behind it. And that's why a lot of times it's almost useless. I actually, you know, had this at a certain point and it it didn't really work out for me. Uh, one of my other interests besides music is art. And I grew up reading and being really into comic books and fantasy art and things. Uh, I used to draw a lot before I kind of settled on music as my my true love and path and everything, I was actually seriously considering getting into drawing comic books. I used to draw constantly. A number of people, you know, told me on a regular basis. I had real talent and ability. I could just look at things and draw them. And I could copy things really quickly. I understood anatomy. I did some pretty good work. I was fairly advanced for my age. And that was the problem. I didn't get... I didn't go for classes. I didn't get structured anatomy books. I didn't study a method. I didn't try and refine my ability. And I just took it for granted that I was good at drawing. And it didn't go anywhere. I gradually did it less and less. And of course, music started taking its place. And, you know, so fair enough. But I could have been, to I realize now, I could have been totally a, a good graphic artist if I had wanted to. I could have been a fine art painter. I could have done any of that stuff had I really sat down and regimented myself. But for some reason, when I sat down with bass, I felt a spark for it, and I liked it, but I didn't have a special talent. I do not have any kind of outrageous Eddie Van Halen level, you know, Tosin Abasi kind of thing that just sets me apart from other people. It all came through hard work and spending hours and hours and hours doing it. And the thing is, people go, oh, well, yeah, you have to spend all this time. If you don't enjoy it, you're in trouble. And that's the thing. I did it because I knew it was going to pay off, something I didn't understand when I used to draw. And I liked doing it. I liked sitting there going, this feels impossible. And then at the end of, say, 30 days, uh -huh, uh -huh, being able to look at a recording of myself playing it and going, that's right, that this is the house that Rodney built. And being able to honestly, and not in an egotistical way, but look at yourself and go, who kicked ass? Who owns this right here? It's a great sense of self-esteem and it goes forward, but it's because of work. And that's the other thing. Having talent doesn't give you the same level of self-esteem. So again, it can almost be a crutch or a holdback. You don't get that satisfaction. When when you can just do something, when it doesn't take anything out of you, when you didn't have to fight to achieve it, it it's kind of like, you know, the Lamborghini that you saved up for and, you know, sacrificed for. You have pride in that car. You know, you, you're you like, yeah, I bought this car with my own money and all this. The trust fund kid that gets one from his parents wraps it around a tree in a week because he doesn't care. It doesn't matter to him that much. So in so many ways, hard work is not only more likely to pay off than talent, but it's a better thing to have under your belt because it applies to almost everything and the rewards are much sweeter. So 
don't let yourself get hung up on it. Don't let people tell you this crap about, oh, somebody's so talented or this or that, or you need to have this special ability to do it. It's garbage. The greatest players I've ever met, every one of them, have, had this, have said the same thing. I'm not naturally talented. It was hard work. So take that for what it is. I guarantee it's the truth. And if you think it's not, sign up for that challenge. I'll walk you through it. I'll show you all the stuff that I had to learn painfully over the years and give it to you much faster. So one day you can be giving me lessons and I could use some new ideas. So help me out. In any case, that's going to do it for this week. Again, uh, patrons, check out your channel. Some cool stuff coming up. And I'm working on a super secret holiday surprise for you guys. I think it's going to be real cool. In any case, that's it. I'll see you on the next one.